All right, Mark chapter 5, told you we're going to start a new chapter, verse 1, and we're reading 20 verses, okay? So they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasians. When he got out of the boat, Jesus, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling amongst the tombs, and no one was able to bind him any more, even with cha a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly night and day he was screaming amongst the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. Shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Jesus had been saying to the demoniac, Come out of the man, you unclean spirits. And he was, he was asking him, What is your name? And he, the demoniac, said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. He began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. I lost my place looking at my phone. Orville Hospital's calling. I have no idea why. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen, the herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. They began to implore him to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him, imploring Jesus that he might accompany Jesus. And Jesus did not let him, but said to him, Come, Go home to your people Report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. You know, when you stood up, when Vicki had you stand up, not, not one of you scared me. Not one of you frightened me. Because I, I don't see your freedom as something to be scared of. I don't see the power of God working in somebody's life as something to intimidate. And yet, in my ministry, I have seen thousands and thousands and thousands of people go from that crazy look in their eyes, that behavior and actions of incredible demonism to their right mind. And I have seen it so many times. And it's not, it doesn't scare me. In fact, I can't even understand why the power of God would scare me. But it does scare people. And all the people I've known, thousands and thousands who've been born again and changed. We can talk about them today, what they were like and what they were doing. Do you remember when you used to steal from my job sites? Or do you remember when you used to curse me in the streets? That kind of thing. We can talk about it. And it's exciting. We say, praise the Lord. I mean, so glad you've changed. But all of them have had family members that tried to talk them out of it. You don't need to be here. You're all better now. And they talk, talk them out of it. Their change scares their family members. When I led Vicki to Jesus, I became the most hated person in her family. When I married her, they hated me. I don't think, you know, we can say I drank too many sodas at the picnic or from the refrigerator, so you hate me, but I don't think that was the case because this lady was the most generous lady I ever knew, her mother. But the family hated me. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong other than 
cause Vicky to find God, have a relationship with Jesus. And she was bubbling. I mean, if you saw Vicky, there was this dark girl and then there was this light girl. There was this unhappy person and then there was this happy person. And she didn't even recognize she was unhappy. She was just worldly. After she became happy, she said, well, that was pretty empty. I really wasn't happy. That was a fake thing. Yet her family was upset by it. And I read this story, and I see these people. It says, they saw the man who had been demon-possessed. That scared the crud out of him. He broke chains. He cut himself with rocks. Like, <laughs> you know, keep him in the hills. Keep him in the tombs. Jesus, why'd you bring him out of the tombs? But then they saw him and they were scared. And I see people all the time scared that you're getting better, scared that you're doing well, upset that they don't have what you say you have. Cursing, cursing. I've been cursed so much in my life by people who want me. I remember a guy saying, I hate you so. And I'm like, that's a strong word in a, for a Christian in my church to tell me they hate me so. Can you tell me why? What did I do? It's your, it's your, it's your marriage, it's your kids, it's your truck. And I'm like, my truck? You hate me because of my truck? Have you seen my trucks? They're very bland. They're new. I buy new trucks, but they're bland. I don't buy fancy. I don't get all flashy. But he hated me for my tr truck. But he didn't hate me for any of that. He hated me for the fruit of the Spirit of being free when he wasn't, when he couldn't be. No matter how many times I said, you can be. Do what I do. Believe what I believe. Follow who I follow. Listen to who I listen to. And you can have what I'm talking about. I hate you. Like, wow. Really? I didn't, you know, not let you play quarterback when we were little? I didn't, like, call you stupid or ugly or anything. You hate me because I'm blessed. And that's kind of what's going on. These people see this guy right-minded, and they're, like, freaking out. Jesus, get out of here before any of the rest of us get healed. That's kind of like, you know, you go to a, maybe you go to a meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, you start talking about Jesus, and they stand up mad at you. This isn't a religious place. This ain't a church. They're afraid you're going to be, they're going to have to be asked to be free. We're going to, you know, you might get free if you listen to me. That's not what we're here for. To be like you? Free? Anyway, let me tell you the story of the Gadarenes. So Jesus gets in a boat and he goes across this lake. And at this point, this is where the storm is. He's sleeping in the boat. If you were here last week, it's only five miles across at this point. It's seven miles across at its widest point. It's a 15-mile-long lake, sea, they call it. And he's going over to Garis, the land of the Gerasians, which earlier in history was called Gadar Gad, the land of Gad, which is named after the tribe of Gad, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. On their way to the promised land, wandering in the desert for 40 years, the, Gad, the Gadareans, the sons and daughters of Gad, the descendants, the tribe of Gad, came upon this land and they said, this land's perfect for grazing. It's great for livestock. And they went to the Moses and they said, we don't think anything in there in the promised land is better than this for grazing. Would it be okay? Oh, excuse me. They submitted themselves to Moses and said, would it be okay if we stay in Gad, in this area? Well, they said, why? You mean you're going to stay here and let your brothers fight for the promised land. They said, no, we will fight with you. We will, our, our, we will, our men will go with you and win the promised land for you. Kick out all the inhabitants, take it, steal it, whatever you want to call it. You know, In today's world, you're, they're stealing the land, but God is giving it to them. And the Gadareans say, Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh are going to stay behind and take this land. And they let them go. But they said, you got to come help us get our land. So the promised land is really only overtaken by the remaining tribes. Gadareans, they help the Reubenites and the Gadareans and the sons of Manasseh, they help them win this. 
They even say, we will go to the front of the army. We'll be the first ones in battle if you let us keep this land. So they let them. Now, for me, it's God chose you a land. He said, from that mountain to that river to that mountain to that tree forest, I'm giving you this land, and it's land flowing with milk and honey. And you say, that's really nice, God, but I, want, I got a better idea. That's really what happened. Over time, trying to make this quicker, over time, the Gadareans began to marry the people outside. They began to invite them in with their gods. And they, oh, I'm sorry, the other condition besides fighting for the land, you continue to obey the law of Moses, and you're part of the community of the Jewish nation. But they started inviting other nations in, letting other gods come in, and they polluted the Jewish religion. It's interesting that in the land of Gad, there's 2,000 pigs. Because part of the law of Moses is no pigs. No pork, no bacon. A land without bacon. But the Gadareans and the Reubenites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they have pigs. They have other gods. They are only partially Jew. They're even maybe the land of Samaria. It's all, they've fallen away and become what's called lukewarm Jewish descendants. They only partially obey God, and they didn't want what God had. And within a few generations, they don't have what God has. But they're still the descendants of Jacob. So Jesus gets in a boat. He's sailing over there, and he steps on the land. And this is so powerful for me. He was, this guy is breaking chains. He speaks in a he, he calls himself we. And he says, we are many, for we are legion. We are legion, for we are many. Now, you can Google what a legion is, and it's all different numbers, because through history it was different numbers. But in Jesus' time, 4,200 soldiers to 5,000. Most being 5,000, but with sickness and everything, you had to have 4,200 to be a legion. Shortly after that, they revised it to 6,000. But in Jesus' time... So just go with the low number, 4,200 demons in one man. And you can see why he calls himself we. And he approached, and so Jesus is in, let's say, he's, you know, like George Washington, the prow of the boat. And, and, and it, and it, hits, the, it hits the ground and he steps out of it. And Jesus' land hits the ground. I want to remind you of some stories I've told before. Dad would say, mow the lawn. I wouldn't mow the lawn. Wouldn't start pulling on that thing all day long. My dad is coming home. I hear the tires on the road, and fear starts to grip me. I haven't mowed the lawn. Authority is coming home. I'm aware of it. I'm waiting in the driveway to tell him. It wouldn't start, Dad. It wouldn't start. Somewhat like Jesus is coming home to Gad. God is returning to Gad where he left them and he gave them rules. You can stay here, but you got to do these things. They didn't do those things. And they had pigs in their land. And they had other gods in their land. And he still sent them Jesus. And Jesus steps out of the boat onto the land. Authority has arrived in Gad. This man, nobody can subdue him. Nobody can control him. All Jesus did was step out of a boat and the man runs to him. Authority is in the land. He, God is in the land. He breaks free. The man, whoever his name is, I don't know, breaks free to run to Jesus. He has enough time to get in the face of Jesus before he's under control again. And, and he says, Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High God, what are you doing here? And Jesus says, come out of that man. Now in Mark, when Mark tells it, it's one man. When Matthew tells it, it's two men. But Generally, it's accepted this story is one man. And he says, come out of that man. Come out of that man. Leave him now. It does not appear that it's immediate. There's a conversation. Don't torment us. Conversation. Let us go in the pigs. That's always fascinated me. 
Let us go to another place of disobedience, the pigs. And there's only 2,000 pigs for 4,200 demons minimum, maybe 6,000 demons, and they drown themselves. And it's like, this is a really weird story. But out of it, you find out who's in charge. He, it's, you know what it says in verse 13? I want to find verse 13. Oh, see, I kind of, this is the problem with page turning during a story. Jesus gave them permission. Demons that we see as this enemy of God, and it's a, it's a uh, fight back and forth. But who's in control here? Whose power was in the land stepping out of the boat? It's like, who has the power here? And if he has the power here, and when he arrives, demons ask permission and do what they're told. It says he gave them permission to go in the, in the uh, pigs. Uh, Jesus is in control. They literally work for him. And I have had a ministry of helping people get free from demons. I have had a ministry of becoming, I'm trying to get free myself. But how do they have a right to me? How do they have a right to you? Well, for many years and many, 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 many different preachers, I believed they couldn't. Then why is it I'm out of control? Then why is it this temper rises and it doesn't seem like I have any, any, any defense against it? Why does my lust get carried away so easy? Why, why don't? Why? Why does it seem like somebody has handles on my back and I want to go this way, but they're turning me. It's like, no, no, I can't. Oh, dang it, I did it again. Anybody relate? Anybody relate to that? Long after I profess Jesus. Long after. Decades after. Going deep, man, learning everything, eating and devouring his word, falling at his altar, laying prostrate before him, calling out to him for mercy, and I still am screaming in the night, why? And crying and begging for help. And, ha and I have no control over certain, certain areas. Certain things. Why? You're getting caught. Oh, how did I get here again? Anybody? Am I the only one? Okay, so there. Okay, so it's more than me. Yeah. You know, the people come. They see him sitting there. All better. Completely different. It's a visible thing. And they look at Jesus and say, "Get out of here. Get out of here, Jesus." In case you try to heal us, take away our buddies. I, I never believed that was true until I was praying with a guy one day. And, and in my deliverance ministries, I literally get control of an invisible being. And I know it. And I'm sorry if this scares you, but it's a real deal. And I have total control. And I've had many. I could have hands raised right now of all the people that I've had helped get delivered. And it, it completely changes their life. And I have this guy. I have, I have his buddies. And we are. And then all of a sudden, I don't. They're gone. What the heck happened? And I look at the guy and say, did you just do that? Because I know they have no power over me. They only have agreement with him. I said, did you do that? He goes, yeah. You came to me because you're tired of being enslaved. What happened? He said, well, when I was little and hiding under my bed from my dad, beating my mom. They were with me under there. They comforted me. They've been my friends my whole life. Your friends? You've been an addict your whole life. You've been miserable your whole life. How are they good to you? I'm telling you, Jesus can set you free. I'm telling you, He can bring you joy unspeakable, full of glory, peace that passes understanding. Amazing things. And I could not help this guy. He finally ended the meeting with, I, I can't let him go. This is a real deal. 21st century real deal. Uh, he's in prison for murdering a couple. Shortly after that, they got worried that they almost got sent out. He almost let them go. 
And it's a horrible thing. He committed murder. Insanity. And I've had many since where the people stop me and I go, why would you stop me? They can't, they can't disobey. They have to do what you want them to do. I come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get out of Him. And they have to go. But it's up to you. It's by your will. So you have to, by your will, they will go. This guy seemingly was so sick and tired of being insane, Jesus came into the room and he ran to him and got set free. And, and I, in my life, have journeyed to find out what right does anything have to control me if I've given my life to Jesus? And Jesus has been really clear. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Forgive not and you will not be forgiven. Judge and you will be judged. I, judge not and you will not be judged. Now your English word for judge is not the word here. If I say what you're doing is wrong, you say don't judge me. That's not what this is talking about. In fact, I'm, I'm actually responsible if I see you doing wrong and don't tell you. I'm actually held accountable by the Bible. It's you're going to hell. You're evil. It's identity. It's final determination of your identity and the final determination of your soul. That's what I'm not allowed to do. That's what none of us are allowed to do. And if you judge somebody and you want them punished, you haven't forgiven them, and you've judged them and found them guilty, you've sentenced them to punishment for what they did to you. This is what you're not allowed to do. Does that make sense? So, if these are the only two things in Christianity where you could have an, a, a, a control in your life from an enemy that is under God's authority. Who's in control? If you will forgive and not judge, they won't have this authority in your life. You'll become a person who can tell them in the name of Jesus. You can command them. I've seen this. And I'm telling you, this story today isn't just a story for those days. I have met so many insane people that I used to know when they were sane, claiming Jesus, but wouldn't let him go. Cannot, I can't let them go. They're my buddies. And it's so weird. It comes down to, will you forgive? Will you let them not be punished for what they did to you? And i got to tell you, I know being a pastor with all the counseling I get to do and how many people tell me the horrors that were done upon them. And then I get to live through remembrances of the horrors that I've had done to me. And i got to tell you, I want them punished. I really do. I want to hurt them bad myself. You understand? I really do. A friend of mine posted on the 50th reunion book that's coming up. We're having our 50th next month from high school. He posted some my torture as though he was a hero. I really wanted to hurt him. Like, I really want to. I feel like it would really serve me well to hurt him. But I know, if I demand that he be hurt, this is not going to work out good for me. So I immediately started confessing. I first confessed to my pastors, the guys in this church that are ordained. I confessed to them. I saw it and I wanted to kill him. I'm going to need some help. Then I asked you to pray for me. And that's what you got to do. Jesus is in the land. Come to him. He got out of the boat. Authority's here. The king is here. All hail to King Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. All hail his majesty. He's here to set you free. He's here to set you free. And we really don't have any excuse. Paul the Apostle said, Don't anybody say that you've been overcome by temptation. For with every temptation is afforded to you a way of escape, 
For no, over, no temptation has overcome you except that which is common to man. And Jesus died for every common temptation you could have. And the only ones overcoming you are the ones directly related somehow to your hindrances, demonic hindrances, because you demand that somebody be hurt for what they did to you. And I realized again, here I thought, oh, I'm free. I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm good. I'm not good. If I want someone to die for what they did for me, I'm not good. And you can feel, you can go ahead and think about your wounds and wonder about it. Are you free? If you're not, then you're like the demoniac in the rocks. Maybe you don't have 4,000. I don't know. I hope we don't have that many. I've helped people get rid of 10 and 20. But <clears throat> hopefully you don't have 50. Hopefully you, I, I, just, I mean, you can get free. The king is here. The king is here. We bow to the king. He's here. What have you to do, Jesus, Son of the Lord Most High? Don't let me be tormented, but set me free. I'm willing to let everyone that hurt me not be punished for what they did to me. So I can't forgive them for what they did to you. And if you don't forgive them, they're going to be punished. And I can't forgive them for what they did in the whole world. All the sins against God that they've committed, I have no power over that. <clears throat> I only have the power of one thing. Can I forgive them for what they did to me? Which the definition of forgive, let me just tell you, I don't want them punished for what they did to me. Dad abandoned you. You never knew him. Never thought you were worth it. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's so many. Plus all you poor ladies who've been abused by us men. It's horrible. We are terrible. And we afflict women all over the world. But I'm sorry. I'm Being a man, I might be self-serving, but you have to forgive us. Or you can't be free. You have to not want us punished for what we did to you. As a man, I could say to every woman in the crowd, if you could just look at my eyes, I'm so sorry for what we did to you. As fathers, as grandfathers, as husbands, as boyfriends, as just stupid men hurting women who were supposed to care for and cover, but instead we wound and abuse. And I'm so sorry we did that. But here's what Jesus said to this demoniac. Stay here and tell of the wondrous things that have been done for you. Tell. Tell of the wondrous things that have been done for you. You young men whose fathers abandoned you, I have been a father to so many, and as a father to so many, I'll just tell you, I'm so sorry. On behalf of us fathers that have so much power in your life, I'm so sorry for what we did to you. How we didn't value you. We created you with our own lust, but then we didn't value you as you were born to us. I'm so sorry. Would you forgive us? Would you pray to God and ask that your father be set free from punishment for what he did to you? And I know sometimes it's horrendous, horrid. You've been through so much hell for so long because of what your dad did to you. I'm so sorry. I really am. But this invisible force that God placed on the earth for a purpose, I think, to chase you to Him. I think they're like the wolves biting at your rear to make you run to God. I run here, He's still biting me. I run here, He's still biting me. Oh, to God! And the wolves are gone. Ouch! Ouch! But there's Jesus! Oh, thank you! Who? no more wolves. You hear what I'm saying? Am I making sense to you? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, and I'm going over, but I, I think it's really important. And then when you, <laughs> and then when you've forgiven, it's so important to st start telling of the wondrous things that He's done for you. Ah, it's so important. Do you even know the wonder? Can you even, even get out of your pain or your hurt so, uh, far enough to say <laughs> how wonderful it is what He's done for you? I don't even know 
how to do an altar call right now. I think it'd be foolish not to do one. I think you're hurting. I think you're... The, the, the real master of this subject is her. You should listen to her. And you should respond. Every, if it's all of you, then make it all of you. Turn around and kneel in your chair, but break, break, the, break the, the trance that's holding you still to not get healed. And like the demoniac, he had one, like Jesus steps in the land and he has the freedom to run to him. Can you imagine how little freedom that ever, man ever felt in his life? Since 4,000 plus demons entered him, he had never had any control or freedom. Jesus steps in the land. He's got one freedom. He's allowed to run to Jesus, and that's it. That's all it took. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe so that you never miss another video or live stream. And if you'd like to support the Father's House, just click the Give button. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you soon.